So what I want to show you first is basically the origins of corn, you know, where it comes from and, you know, the mystery surrounding corn and, and, and these type of plants that appear to have been genetically uh, altered at some point. So you see how the scientists have been able to track uh, the uh, origin of corn uh, to the Americas and how and found the, its ancestor and they determined that it was uh, somehow uh, genetically modified to get uh, to the corn that we see today so at some point some great science you know some ancient knowledge you know the creator you know some divine knowledge and science allowed us to have the fruits and vegetables we have today and even though they know 
uh, that this was genetically altered. They still don't know how or who, but you know, all the ancient stories we're going to start seeing, you know, they give credit to the gods. And we read that earlier as well. If you guys remember in, Te in, in Tibet, it's the first agricultural plant that was given to uh, the people by the gods, right? So we're going to start seeing this. And again, to today and day, scientists still don't know how it was altered, this, this uh, plant. You know, there's a lot of articles you can read online about this. Uh, this one right here says, Maize, or corn, as it is called in the United States. It is one of the three cereal grains upon which world civilizations were founded. It has been described as having a passport without a birth certificate. Wilkes and Goodman, 1996. Because although it is one of the most widely grown food crops around the globe today, its precise parentage has been controversial. All right, so they don't know how it was made. Great civilizations need a great asset. Ancient Egypt had the Nile, uh, right? Uh, we're starting to connect that with the uh, Mississippi River, you know? So, you know, do the research. The Mayans had maize, or corn as others call it. So maize is accepted as man's first and perhaps his greatest feat of genetic engineering. Okay, what well, we just talked about, what we saw in the video, how it was altered, right? Continuing. It nevertheless remains a largely enigmatic crop. Despite decades of research, there is no known wild ancestor. There is no known way to, to evolve a non-shattering uh, variant. It is known that maize does not have a method to propagate itself and thus relies on humans to survive as a species. All right, so these things don't, corn doesn't grow in the wild. It needs human help to, to harvest, to you know, to especially to genetically alter it for it to become like the corn we see today, like especially that big sweet corn, you know. Indeed, the human race, and definitely in the pre-Columbian New World, has entered into a powerful symbiosis with this cereal that has f fed and continues to feed us. All right, so corn is very important to humans, not only you know, ancient world or certain countries, it's important to most all uh, civilizations, all humans. At DNA level, it, all major cereals, rice, wheat, barley, and maize are very much alike. But maize is and acts differently from the rest. Left unattended, the other cereals will propagate themselves. Maize will not. The reason for this is that maize kernels are lo located inside a tough husk and hence it requires humans to sow maize. It cannot reproduce on its own. This is of course a major evolutionary disadvantage. But as maize has been created by mankind, we have always guaranteed that the species does not die out. Far from it. Do you see? If we stopped growing it, it would go extinct. That's what they're saying. Because it doesn't grow in the wild. Uh, so you guys can understand. I mean, it only grows because we plant it so linked to us harvest harvesting it taking care of it you know that's how it's evolved <laughs> no wild ancestor of maize has ever been found despite decades of research maize closest relative is a mountain grass called teosinte which we saw in the video which looks nothing like maize it is neither a practical food source most grasses develop grain near the top of the stem which when mature will let the seed shatter and the grains will fall to the ground from which new grasses will grow. It guarantees the survival of the species, but it, but it is ill-suited for human agriculture. In wild wheat and barley, a single gene mutation has blocked such shattering, which meant that these cereals became more easily harvestable for humans. Teosinte shatters too, and there is no known non-shattering variant. Furthermore, at least 16 genes control teosinte and maize shattering, resulting in a complex problem for those trying to figure out how a non-shattering variation of maize might have occurred naturally by accident, or how our distant ancestors figured out how to create such a feat, scientists continue to have no idea. And this is, you know, 
I mean, just think about it. So, I mean, we have all these uh, depictions of the gods and stories of gods giving the plan to um, humans, right? And, and just look at the research that science tells us. It tells us that somebody did alter and genetically created uh, uh, the maize we have today, the corn we have today, uh, because it doesn't grow in the wild, you know? And they don't know how, or they probably do, and they don't want to tell us, but since we are always been in this journey relating everything to, you know, our true past, you know, the Old Testament, the Bible, you know, how far-fetched is that, you know, our Creator would give us the science, right? We know Enoch had the science, right? What it was before it was hijacked, right? That science to create uh, mice or, or corn, just like this. All right, so it's not that far-fetched. We see that some, we it, even scientists don't know. So if they can't tell you where it comes from, how can they tell you where it doesn't come from? You know what I mean? <laughs> so, you know, that's us for us, you know, to use our intuition and our, our senses, our knowledge, our research to put all this together. It says here, ancient popcorn discovered in Peru. It says in small letters here first, it says, these ancient corn cups date roughly from 6,500, 4,000 years ago. People living along the coast of Peru were eating popcorn 2,000 years earlier than previously reported and before ceramic pottery was used there. According to a new paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, co-authored by Dolores Piperno, curator of the New World Archaeology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History, and Emeritus Staff Scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. All right, so let's keep going. So let's hear a 5,000-year-old corn cup found at a pyramid at the ancient Peruvian site of Carol Supe, which appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Haas team of researchers examined and evaluated ancient microscopic residues of maize in the form of pollen, starch grains, and uh, feet Tolids, plant silica bodies found in soil on the stone tools and in cro cropo, sorry, coprol lights from ancient sites using 212 instances where carbon 12, 14 dates were obtained. They focused on 13 desert valley sites of Patibilca and Fortaleza, north of Lima, where they found broad botanical evidence that indicated extensive production. Extensive, right? extensive production, processing, and consumption of my yeast between 3000 and 800 BC. Uh, Coincides with uh, the last Nakata three, right? If we remember the ancient Nakata periods. And after that, the first dynasty of Menes, right? Or Mizraim, which is Ham's son, or Menes, was after that. So during this time, it says extensive production and processing was going on in Peru. Right? It says the two most extensively studied sites were Caballete, about six miles inland from the Pacific Ocean and consisting of six large platform uh, mounds arranged in a U-shape. So again, it's, it says it's consisting of six large platform mounds arranged in a U-shape and the site of Huaritanga, about 14 miles inland, featuring one large mound and several smaller mounds. They targeted residences, trash pits, ceremonial rooms, and campsites, but most of the samples were taken from trash pits of residents. Nor is that all. It turns out that sweet potatoes were the second most popular carbohydrate and guava the most popular source of sugar. House reports shows that rather than being a maritime based society, Chico Norte was an agriculturally based society. This means that South America falls in line with the rest of civilizations of the world. All right? It falls in line with the rest of civilizations of the world, not of the Americas, of Sumer, of Egypt, of Babylon, of Mesopotamia, of the world. Prior to this latest discovery about corn, it was generally accepted by historians that Maiz was domesticated in Tehuacan Valley of Mexico. The Olmecs and Mayans cultivated it in numerous varieties throughout Mesoamerica cooked, ground, or processed through nixtamalization, and we're going to learn what that is, that's how you make the masa, right, to make the dough for the breads and all the other uh, things you can do with the dough. Uh, beginning about 2500 BC, the crop spread through much of the Americas. 
Okay. The region developed a trade network based on surplus and varieties of maize crops. However, as can now be seen, corn was being grown in the coastal region of Chico Norte in South America as early as 5000 BC. So it's uh, actually rewriting history here because they've, they've, there's evidence here showing that it was already being uh, grown extensively in 5000 BC. All right, this is way before the Nakata periods, all right? Way before Nakata periods, in line with summer Mesopotamia, even possibly older. And you're telling me, all right? Remember, agriculture starts out, I mean, civilization starts out with agriculture, right? That's, that's how they have come down to summarize uh, the start of civilizations. And we can see here that in the Americas, they already had mounds, they had pyramids. I'm going to show you. Uh, the city, as you can see, and um, so for them to get to uh, this point of uh, being civilized, like building mounds, having the science, the knowledge, uh, language, and agriculture, it takes time. So even before that, they were getting this started. So they're even older than that. It says here, in order to trace mice paternity, botanists led by colleague, my colleague John Dobley of the University of Wisconsin rounded up more than 60 samples of Teosinte from across its entire geographic range in the Western Hemisphere and compared their DNA profile with all the varieties of maize. They discovered that all maize was genetically most similar to Teosinte, typed from the tropical central Balsas River Valley of southern Mexico, suggesting that this region was the cradle of maize evolution. So the cradle of maize evolution, we saw that agriculture is basically what helps uh, create civilizations and, and for people to settle down. So as you can see the cradle of maize evolution is over here So agriculture, right? So the cradle of civilization actually, you know, so you see how they have cradle here in parentheses Right, so they're not gonna tell us straight up the cradle of civilization. They're gonna say the cradle of maize evolution, but you know, they teach us that um, Sumeria Mesopotamia is the cradle of civilization but we are seeing that there's there was civilizations on this side of the world that are older than Mesopotamia and archaeologists are confirming that in these days, right? After 2008, they started finding a lot of things in Peru, all right? So let's continue. So it says, furthermore, by calculating the genetic distance between modern maize and balsas teosinte, they estimated that the domestication occurred about 9,000 years ago. You hear that, right? That's 7,000 BC, 9,000 years ago. It says here, For most of human history, our ancestors relied entirely on hunting animals and gathering seeds, fruits, nuts, tubers, and other plant parts from the wild for food. It was only about 10,000 years ago that humans in many parts of the world began raising livestock and growing food through deliberate planting. These advances provided more reliable sources of food and allowed for larger, more permanent settlements. Native Americans al alone domesticated nine of the most important food crops in the world. So Native Americans are responsible for domesticating nine of the most important food crops in the world. You hear that, right? I mean, that goes to show you that's, that's where it all originates and it's longer, it's older, all right? Including corn more properly called maize or semais, which now provides about 21% of human nutrition across the globe. It says here, uh, corn originated in the Americas. In the autumn, we see a type of corn called Indian corn, but really all corn, some 250 kinds of it, is Indian. Called maize in many languages, corn was first cultivated in the area of Mexico more than 7,000 years ago to spread throughout and spread throughout North and South America. Native Americans probably bred the first corn from wild grasses and crossed high yielding plants to make hybrids. At the right are three varieties of Lenape corn, Delaware, black or blue corn, grandmother corn, and white flower corn. Old varieties of corn typically had small ears with eight or 10 rows. Native Americans, including the Lenape of the Delaware Valley, used corn for many types of food. The foods which we know were derived from corn in the, in the Iroquois nations include dumpling, tamales, hamini, 
and a ceremonial wedding cake bread and uh, tamales because we still eat tamales all over the, the, the American continent you know all the native tribes uh, a lot in Spanish countries also they make tamales right uh, today corn has become the most widely grown crop in the Western Hemisphere it is a staple in Latin American diets and in the United States alone corn has given rise to regional specialties as grits hush puppies ash cakes uh, Dodgers, muffins, crackling bread, Johnny cakes, and corn pone or pon. The word uh, pun or pon is derived from an Algonquin word and is related to the Delaware word baked, a pan. So, pan, right? Again, pan or pancio, right? They were calling corn nearly pancio, and that means, and for us, pan is bread. So, you see that the word a pan the, for the Napi Delaware. Well, the Algonquin word, I'm sorry, it's, it's actually means baked. So, um, Native Americans also use corn for other purposes, so, such as uh, mattresses, containers, and toys. All right, so it was very useful. This here is the Alberton de Verga map. It's a map that uh, I found back in 1995. I brought it out of hiding, and I, I introduced it to the scientific community. Now, the important thing about this map it was made by Alberton de Verga, who was a Venetian, in 1414. And it's a secret commercial map. But it shows up here, this is north of the British Isles. Here's the British Isles, Spain, Norway, Africa, Mediterranean, Italy. North of the British Isles, we have this orange or red continent. And it sticks out from Norway. Well, there were many names for this ancient continent. The Norwegians called it Norveka, or Dusky Norway. The Irish called it Hibernia Major, or Great Ireland. And the Scots called it Estoteland, or New Scotland. This is interesting to me, right north and west of the British Isles, because in Europe, during the 13th, 14th, 15th centuries, the merchants from across the seas, from this land area that appears on this map, they were bringing maize and turkeys across the ocean, across the Atlantic Ocean. And these were bring, being introduced into Northern Europe. Well, there's a number of names that the Northern Europeans had for maize. One was turkey corn, and that's because the corn was fed to turkeys. Another name was Welsh corn, and that's because merchants from Wales were bringing the corn across the Atlantic. And another term was Indian corn, and that's because many people thought that it was India that was located across the sea. Now, uh, when referencing uh, India, it's interesting because, um, as it says here, let me read, it says, I will present in the same order those which might establish the American origin of the plant, and with this assumption, show that the name of Indian weed came to our forefathers from the idea that the new continent was a part of the Asiatic regions comprised then under the general name of India. So, you know, there's a, you're going to read, we're going to read right now, but, you know, the in the old world, special medieval times, they used to have the reference of the three Indians. The rest of the world was considered the three Indians. So it wasn't just in reference of what we think of India, like the one we see today in the maps and the country India, but it was actually the rest of the continent. And as we can read from the book, uh, Lost Tribes and Promised Lands from Ronald Sanders, it says here in the top, I'm just starting in the middle, it says, um, in the uh, apocryphal Acts of St. Thomas the Apostle, moves easily between Persia and India, starting roughly with the 5th century apocryphal writer, the Ciro Abdias, who described the exploits of the Apostles Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew in each of the three Indias. This latter concept became the standard one in the Middle Ages. One of the three Indias faced Ethiopia, according to the Ciro Abdias. The second faced Persia and the third occupied the ends of the earth between the ocean and the realm of darkness. This third uh, became especially fruitful for the geographical imagination, the region of untold islands in which the pl plural term Indias etymologically, etymologically one and the same as Indies, okay, came to the rest for the one for all.
so you, you're hearing this right so there was three indias there was one even referred to as one uh, that went uh, to the ends of the earth between the oceans and the realms of darkness or so far away right for the uh, these europeans uh, they didn't know where it was uh, it had a region of untold islands right the indias or the indies right the west indies caribbean all right you're hearing this right so it says and just to add here in the bottom it says by the definitions of the three indias among medieval geographers but for most europeans even learned ones the term covered a vast and distant region of dark-skinned peoples culminating in a countless array of islands in one direction and, and ethiopia the biblical cushion in the other okay you hear this so it wasn't even it wasn't just that it, the rest of the contents were referred as to the three indias but it's telling you that dark-skinned people lived in these places okay so let's continue so we find similar names for turkeys and corn indian corn welsh corn turkey corn turkeys welsh hens and dindons or indian hens and names for turkeys uh, and this is because merchants were carrying these animals across the sea and this is really intriguing to me because the mystery of Egyptian maize got its start in Scotland when a number of my colleagues, uh, time detectives, noticed that there were carvings of the maize plant or Indian corn inside Rosslyn Chapel. And Rosslyn Chapel is, no, is located right in the vicinity of Edinburgh, Scotland. In 2006, I got messages from two friends who urged me to see the evidence of corn in Rosslyn Chapel in Edinburgh. Here's an aerial view of the exterior of the chapel uh, from a tourist brochure. Here's the stone vault inside the chapel. The red arrow is on a corn cob that has been carved into a stone vault. The corn cob is identified by a conical shape and parallel rows of beads or kernels arranged along the surface. This is a comparison of the Mayan corn god with Rosslyn corn. In both cases there are rows of corn beads on the leaves. This shows a similar treatment of the artistic design. Here's an illustration of turkey corn from Fuchs Herbal of 1542. Early corn in Europe was called Indian corn or turkey corn. One reason it was called turkey corn is because it was imported to feed turkeys. Turkeys were New World farm birds that were known to the Romans and the Turks. The wild American turkey gobbler roamed the forests of Mexico and North America. It was imported to the Roman Empire along with, the, with turkey corn and Indian millet in parentheses, or maize, as uh, it was. Carried on board Turkish grain ships, it acquired the name Turkey in Britain. In Gaul, it was called uh, the Indon, or the Bird of India. Norse ships carried the fowl to Sweden, where it was known as Kalkum, or Welsh hen. Hansa merchants resumed imports of the tasty fowl in 1250. The bird was known in Germany as Truth, Hun, or Welsh Hen. Targets 1552 noted that bird feed was also called Welsh corn, indicating that it was imported from the Welsh colonies. A. W. Schroger, 1966-471, noted that ancient turkey bones were common in Ireland. All right, so you see all these references uh, uh, in that part of Europe. Uh, that northwestern part uh, Lincoln uh, all those stories and all those legends they have here we're going to get more into that how the you know the Vikings and uh, all these uh, Welsh explorers and English explorers went over to America all right so uh, this is way before Columbus so let's continue during the 16th century and probably much earlier Germans called maize by the name of Welsh corn according to Welsh legends a prince by the name of Madoc established a colony in the new world during the 11th century Probably Welsh merchants sailing between the colony and Europe brought back corn to northern European ports. And that seems like a plausible explanation for why the Germans referred to maize as Welsh corn. Legends and Lore of Ancient America, edited by Frank Joseph. Irish legends from the same time period tell of a land called Hybresail, Hybresail across the North Atlantic, suggesting an early import of maize from the east coast of North America. Icelandic explorers called the New World grain they found near Wineland self sown corn. This was recorded in a saga from the 11th century back home. You hear this? 11th century. Inhabitants of some German cities called the grain Welsh corn, and it was so named in Hieronymus Box 1572 Book of Plants. Many Europeans identified two kinds of corn at the same time. There was both Pansio 
in Mahis in Spain. So pan is how we say bread in Spanish. England had Turkic corn and Indian corn. Germany had both Welsh corn and in the Indy niches corn, Indy, India, right? Indy, West Indies. The French had bled the Turkey and bled the Inde. Here, Indian referred to the so called New India, right? The New India, right? The third India, right? The three Indias, the one that's in the farthest end, right? Across the ocean, in the dark realm. <laughs> that Columbus identified across the Atlantic, okay? So we're talking about the same one, aren't we? And that he had named in accord with Roman traditions. So he named it New India because Romans knew it was called India. They had it in their maps. We showed you uh, Microbius map, right? And the Greek maps, right? Such multiple names are not consistent with orthodox assumptions that maize was introduced from a single source, such as Spaniards returning from the New World. However, these names are consistent with different kinds of maize being introduced from different sources or at different times. This is the Hecatius map of about 500 BC. It is one of several maps that predate the Phoenician cartography of Marinus and the Roman cartography of Ptolemy. This map has the Gulf of Mexico labeled as the Caspian Sea. A team of Greek explorers in about 500 BC issued a report affirming that this was true. This is Aristosthenes map of about 300 BC. It has a southern continent indicated as the Altar Orbis, meaning the other world. This is an early name for South America, and it's the same name that Columbus used for South America. This is a Roman map by Macrobius, circa 440 AD. It is presently at the Huntington Library in San Marino, California. The map is a very accurate Florida and Gulf of Mexico. Florida was a Roman goddess of springtime. This is an enlargement of the Macrobius map showing the Florida Peninsula and the Gulf of Mexico. The Portuguese had a map of the same area called Antilia, or the Antilles, in 1436. So why does Columbus get credit for discovering lands that were already known to the Romans and the Portuguese? And then going back, back to this book, it says here, uh, Scandinavians called the grain, again, turkey corn, possibly because it was fed to the turkey fowl. This new world bird also reached Europe in ancient times. Thus began a tradition in the northern countries that turkey corn was unfit for human consumption, yet it made excellent feed for fowls and pigs. The earliest reported name for maize in Portugal was Milo Marocco or Milo or corn of Morocco, all right? We just read about the Arabs, right? In the Indian archipelago, which suggests that the Portuguese Portuguese first got maize from North Africa. It says here, Maize and the Monday Myth by M.D.W. Jeffries. Alright, so how to get to North Africa? So we know about the Mandinka, right? Mandinka and the Inca, right? How they were in America before, right? So it says the Mandi or Mali or Mel or Mandingo, a people occupying what has been called the Buckle of Niger have a beautiful and complex creation myth that includes the appearance of Maiz and its eastward migration with them down the Niger to Lake Debo. So, the appearance of Maiz, right, and their eastward migration, right? So if you're going towards the east, that means you're coming from the west. What's west of uh, Africa? America, right? And we know how the Mandinka and the Inca are relating, right? The Inca were in America, right? So, you know, you put this uh, two and two together. Eastward migration, right? If you're in Africa, what's to the west? America. Down the Niger to Lake Debo. All right, so let's continue. In their complex creation myth that includes the appearance of maize in its eastward migration with them down the Niger to Lake Debo, the occurrence of the myth in groups now widely scattered in the Sudan suggests great antiquity. All right, long time ago, great antiquity, and where migrations can be, and where migrations can be dated a time long before the discovery of America is implied. Okay, another source here. All right, way before Columbus discovered America, these Mandinka people had corn already, and North Africa had corn already. This implication casts doubt on the traditional view that maize was introduced into Africa by the Portuguese after they had obtained it from the New World. Alright, so that is bullshit too. 
and uh, just to continue here with uh, West Africa, it says here the plant was known in West Africa as Mizer. We heard that earlier, right, from Egypt. The Arabic word for Egypt. In a letter dated 1514, the trader Goncalo Lopez mentioned his receipt of red corn from Sierra Leone. John Locke, a 16th century mariner, described a weed on the west coast of Africa in 1554 that had ears with more than 200 kernels the size of peas. British seaman Andrew Batchel, 1591, wrote about weed in Angola that was also known as Guinea weed, a common European name for maize in Guinea. The natives called this grain Masa Maputo. Maize was called Clau Eub in Sanguai and Makari in Fuli along the Niger River. In both places, maize was a central part of the culture and religion. When the tribes were first visited by European explorers in the 17th century, in 1746, British botanist Thomas Ashley described four kinds of maize grown in Angola. One variety called Masanga had ears a foot long. The other varieties were called Masambala. Maize was so widespread in Central Africa at the time of Portuguese colonization that some orthodox historians assumed the grain had come via overland routes from Egypt and the Sahara. Although some names suggest that maize was an occasional Portuguese introduction, most native names for maize, along with deep cultural traditions, indicate that maize was present in more ancient times. The earliest Portuguese reference to maize in West Africa is found in the Chronicle of Valentin Fernandez, 1502, who reported seeing Milho or Milho Sabufo along the coast. Later writers compared this plant to Mejiz of the West Indies, all right, the Caribbean, the third India. One writer even included a sketch of a plant as maize in the 1554 book Del Navigate. Chion e Viagi. Just says Semais, origin, Mesoamerica. Summary. Archaeological evidence demonstrates unquestionably that this species was known in pre Columbian Asia. Of particular interest is the discovery in an archaeological site in the island of Timor of remains of Maiz dating to the 3rd millennium BC. So, again, unquestionably archaeological evidence right that this species is known in pre-columbian asia okay all right so encyclopedia britannica is lying to you your history book is lying to you columbus didn't introduce this to the rest of the world okay so it's dating to the third millennium bc the, there probably were separate introductions of primitive zemais strikingly similar plants have been found grown in the himalaya and interior east asia and more developed variety of later date. Names including Sankris names as well as art representations confirm that maize was grown in India before as well as after. A historical record also places the crop in the Middle East by AD 800. Maize may also have reached Eastern Europe as well as Africa in pre-Columbian times, although its immediate source may have been India, Middle East. Okay. More references here. It says here, case one transfer America to Southeast Asia, time of transfer by third millennium BC. It says here, it says case two America to India, and perhaps then to China and the Middle East by the first century BC to India. Great A. It says uh, case three transfer America to Eastern Europe. All right, so those are kind of like the three we've been actually reading about. You know, those kind of three possibilities, and could have been all three. You know, because you know. At some point, they were all connected. Even when they wasn't connected, the lands, these people were traveling back and forth, all right? And returning to uh, this book, it says here, The Treaties of Natural History by Li Chi Ching, written toward the middle of the 16th century. It says here, In conclusion, the maize found at Thebes within a mummy's coffin after a lapse of 30 or 40 centuries would be a precious but solitary relic which would prove that maize existed in Africa since the earliest time. These various points being admitted, there is enough to conclude that maize was known to the old world before the discovery of America, that probably the Arabs or the Crusaders introduced it first into Europe, 
and that subsequently the discovery of America gave occasion for another introduction and wider extent of cultivation of this plant heretofore confined within narrow bounds. I have documented several examples of maize in China going back to the first century. Use of oxen to plow rows of maize is a characteristic of cornrow planting and not millet, which is typically planted like a grass by sowing in the broadcast fashion. The evidence we have seen in the British Isles, Egypt, Nigeria, India, and China all indicate that the ancient travelers had spread maize agriculture all across the world prior to Columbus. A Han Dynasty tablet shows it a distinct row of tall grains plants that were grown in plowed furrows. This is a strong endorsement that the grain is maize. Some scholars have suggested that the Han tablet shows foxtail millet. However, millet was typically scattered broadcast fashion across fields and not grown in rows. Han corn was so large that it made uh, the single cob at the top droop towards the ground. Mangeldorf, 1974, has noted that this is also a characteristic of the arcade American variety of maize. A Song Dynasty ceramic mural clearly shows a maize ear complete with a yellow cob and green husk leaves. All right, you hear that, right? Song Dynasty. Whether or not outsiders inspired the agriculture use of maize, there's evidence that it was already a religious or med medicinal plant. Statues found in Buddhist caves dating to the 6th century have garlands over their shoulders that were made to look remarkably similar to maize cups. Maize is definitely uh, featured on a ceramic mural in Shanghai province where a foot-long yellow cub with kernels has long leaves at the base. California State University professor Sidney Chang identified the mural as 9th or 10th century design. In 1422, Chinese naval officers reported seeing extraordinary large ears of grain on voyages to Africa and India. Thus, the Khan's mariners had ample opportunity to bring home samples of maize already grown in the Old World. Carl Johannesson, Ann Parker, and Juid Ashraf have documented the existence of maize in India by the 12th century. It was known by such names as Makarama, Kundrus, Junhari, and Hanta. Here says maize diffused to India before Columbus came to America. It says here, this 13th century statue from India offers an ear of corn with its left hand proof that the plant was known in the subcontinent long before it was supposedly first introduced to the outside world from America by the Spaniards. All right, take a look. Hindu deities holding maize ears are abundant in northern India, and they soon attracted the attention of American geographers. Stephen Jett provoked the wrath of isola isolationists with his 1976 illustration of a Hindu goddess holding an ear of maize. Orthodox scholars reacted by insisting that the item in her hand must be a stack of beads, candy, or a pomegranate. All right, so you, 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 you see, you hear the... Sculptures on Hoysala temples can be dated by historical accounts to the 12th or 13th centuries. Thus, they are unquestionably of pre-Columbian age. According to Ashraf, the oldest sculptures of maize at Sanchi, India, date to the 2nd century BC. In, in 1995, archaeologist Dr. John Jones traveled to northern India to photograph maize sculptures. His field report is indicative of the conflict that still rages in Hindu universities between adherents of colonial era misconceptions about maize and more recent appraisals of the evidence. When I was at Halibib, he stated, some Indian professors approached me to ask where I was from. Several were botanists. Excitedly, I showed them some of the carvings on the temple, and I asked their opinion on the food being held by the carved figurines. After a short discussion, they said corn. I then told them of the issue of corn being a Western Hemisphere plant. This created more discussion amongst themselves in the local language. All right, so you can see where he's going with this but you see how he made them think he's, they're, now they're discussing amongst themselves these Hindu scholars because of what he just said right continuing it says here unintentionally Jones had ignited a controversy among the group of Hindu scholars 
according to the popular version of history, inherited from British col colonialism. Okay, hear this. Maiz was regarded as a Portuguese import that transformed Hindu agriculture. However, the professors that Jones met at Halibut were well aware that the temple itself dated to the 13th century. After Jones pointed out the obvious contradiction, they must have realized at once that it was impossible for stonemasons to have carved statues with ears of corn more than two centuries before the grain was supposedly introduced by the Portuguese. What other errors, they must have wondered, were taught as part of the official academic doctrine. Right? They, they didn't... <laughs> didn't think nothing of it until this guy Jones mentioned it was American. Then he was like, wait, they were like, there's there's scholars. They hadn't put two and two together yet. But then they were like, wait a minute. These temples are really old. How is there corn carved on these temples before Columbus could have reached America and passed uh, the maize plant or seeds to the English or to the Portuguese? All right, so now it says here at the end, what are the errors? They must have wondered were taught as part of the official academic doctrine and that's for you this message is for you what other errors have they taught us as part of the official academic doctrine think about that this you know i made this video about corn but it's you see it has how do you say evidence we can use to relate or or to show that the old world is america that they were going back and forth that there was communication and, 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 and you know, trade between the, the continents, maybe when they were still together or even apart. You know, they sailed, they had ships. Why not? You know, so let's continue. The speculative rationale fell apart under the thorough research of Carl Johannesson and Ann Parker from the University of Oregon. Okay. Their examination of scores of Hindu statues confirmed that the plants depicted in stone carvings uh, had all the characteristics of maize. All right, it confirmed elongated husk, parallel rows of kernels, and silk strands at the top. Some of the items included hybrid forms of maize with two sizes of grains. Their shapes also conform to the same variety of shapes that are characteristic of maize. Bulbous, conical, and elongated similar maize ears are present in the local markets. The plant sculptures on the temples at Halibib, Missouri, Kaju Raho, and Somathpur are undoubtedly varieties, varieties of maize. So, undoubtedly, right? But this plant is not portrayed here as an agricultural item. It is a sacred one. And this explains one reason why Western scholars failed to notice references to maize in ancient Hindu documents. All right, so it's saying that uh, when when they talk about these uh, statues and carvings and these temples, right, the the, the, the doctrine in, in that part of the world in India is that it's a religious uh, item or icon, right? It's not supposed to be corn. They don't reference it as a plant or agric of agriculture or corn at all. It says here, Johannesson and Wang, Simming, 1998, page 10 to 12. Well, well over a hundred Hindu, Jain, and Buddhist temples bear sculpted depictions of maize being held in the hand of voluptuous female figures. The images of the ears include over 40 anatomical features unique to maize. Example, the shapes of ears or cobs, the representations of corn silk, arrangement of rows in relation to each other, arrangement of kernels, unpollinated, small kernels, etc. All of which indicate that actual maize ears had to have been models for the sculptures. Opponents of this view have suggested other objects being held rather than corn. Those explanations are not credible. Various investigators have also found ancient maize varieties in the hill country of Southeast Asia and the northern India subcontinent. Johannesson found in Bhutan and in Yunnan province, China, maize with tiny grains, four row ears and multiple ears per stalk. 
So you see there's a lot of uh, evidence uh, supporting everything we, we've been reading, everything that we're learning about corn, especially here in India. And let's continue. It says, Gupta independently identified maize as well as a number of other plants of American origin sculpted on Indian temples and monuments. For example, at the Lakshmi Narasimha Temple, Karnataka, Nu Gehali, the eight-armed dancing Vishnu in his female form, Mohini, is holding a corn cob ear in one of her left hands, and the other hands hold the usual emblems of Vishnu. Gupta, 1996, page 176. At least one Maiz representation dates from the first century AD. It says here, cave temple, uh, the, the three, or the third, Badami where uniquely the cob is held horizontally and the stem of the ear shows Johannesson and Parker, 1987b, page 4. And we're almost done with uh, India, but uh, continuing here says, the temple age, the age of these Hoysala temples is fixed by records carved into stone, built-in documentation. Doshi, 1981, Maiti, 1978, and Chopra, 1973. New aspects of research will involve mapping the location and age of early series of sculptures of male Hindu gods that hold maize ears carved into the 5th to 8th centuries AD. Busagli, 1971, page 192. Uh, Bhattacharya, 1974. These are found in West Central India and were sculpted 3 to 6 centuries before maize began to show up in the Hoysala dynasty sculptures to the south of this earlier Gupta realm. Dispersal of temples with statues holding maize continued to the south, but with the difference that instead of maize being held primarily by males, most of the later larger and more intricate representations of maize are held in the hand of female statues. Okay, so at one point it was males, then it was females. This is interesting because, I mean, we heard earlier about the corn goddess, uh, right, and um, also, uh, we're going to see later how uh, the natives had a lot of corn goddesses, uh, female energy. That, uh, also, before that, they had the maize god, which was male energy, kind of the same. And in Egypt as well, we'll see, we'll see that. We'll see Osiris. And then I believe uh, Isis, they're both corn uh, deities. And then in Greek, we'll see that as well. Uh, let's continue. Always with this new distinctive mudra or hand position, it says, so it was talking about the statues. You can note the fertility aspects of this sign for yourself. Surely we have to respect the religious symbolism of maize and a god Siba in this representation. We have shown that living maize had to have been used as the model for the sculptured maize like objects held in the hands of statues in early temples and in outer wall friezes in the Hoysala dynasty temples. So, you know, they basically determined and confirmed that they had to have seen maize, these people who sculpted these temples and, and these uh, statues, these carvings of these gods holding maize, um, because it's an exact replica of, of what an ear or a uh, corn, you know, uh, plant would look like, or the ear, the kernels, and all that, all right? And we've, we've we already read that before, right, with all the scholars saying the same thing. These maize-like objects are of an age that demonstrates subcontinent Indians or their trading associates must have had early sail sailing contact with the Americas or with seafaring traders such as the Arabs, right, the Moors, right, Phoenicians, Africans, Chinese or Malaysians who had had the contact. Maize is found to have been grown 5,000 to 7,000 years ago in America, where the ears were selectively elongated into what we can recognize as the maize of one or two thousand years ago. This fact of sailing contact means that the hundreds of other homologous cultural and technological traits that are found on both sides of the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are also likely to have been exchanged in this trading and missioning missionizing process of the early sailors. Now we start the real work of deciphering the source regions in the new or old, old world cultures for these many features and we've been doing that throughout the whole video. Alright and just to uh, finish up here where India says here some art historians have questioned whether these are ears of corn or of some other plant or object. 
Now listen to this. Corn experts of the U.S. Department of Agriculture who have been shown full photographic documentation of these sculptures concur fully that maize is what is represented by all the specimens displayed on the Indian temple art. All right, so they all concur fully that it's maize. All right, and all these years they've been hiding this from us. All these years they've been telling us these are like uh, some uh, magical plant that the gods gave to them. You know, they're not saying it's maize. They're not telling us it's the truth. All right, and they're still not telling us. All right. So, in fact, some observers have recognized particular New World ecological source regions for the ears used as models by some of the Indian artists. All right, they even look like uh, corns from America. That's what it's saying. As Johannesson had suggested. Moreover, studies of names for maize in India and other parts of Asia find notable similarities with certain American names. Okay? Particularly a connection of names in Amazonia, South America, with South Asian names for maize. And we heard earlier, ja mai, right? Maize is a Taino word. If you trace the Tainos, they, you can trace them back to South America, just like this is saying. Arawakan, right? Arawak language. The Greek god of the underworld was Hades. He is seen here on an image that was taken from a Greek vase. The symbol was a huge cow horn that was filled with grains and fruits. It was called a cornucopia, or horn of plenty. The name for a horn, cornu, was probably the source for the word we use to represent maize. That is, cornu was changed to simply corn. The corn cob was called corn or cornu because it had the shape of a cow's horn. Here's a Minoan merchant and an ocean-going ship circa 1500 BC. This map shows the principal routes that Bronze Age traders used to transport native copper from out of the Great Lakes region. They also brought corn from the same area. Copper traders brought ingots across the North Atlantic to the British Isles, Spain, the Mediterranean, and on to the Middle East. These are a pair of Cretan corn cob rings that were cast from gold in about 2000 BC. They are evidence of the great wealth that was obtained from the corn trade. Corn was the principal food of the lower classes, the merchants, travelers, laborers, slaves, and soldiers. These were the very people upon whose bare backs civilization arose from the earth. It yeah. says here, Orthodox historians justify the fame and glory bestowed upon Columbus by reminding us through such grandiose exhibits of the mariner's illust illustrious achievements. The only problem is that maize cultivation was already present in Europe, Africa and Asia many centuries before Columbus was even born. The antiquity of maize in Europe goes back at least to Roman times. During the first century uh, CE, Pliny the Elder described several plants that were first domesticated in the New World. These included hen, bane, or tobacco and maize, which Pliny called India, India millet. As early as the 16th century, Spanish historians Joseph de Acosta realized that maize like plant was known, I'm sorry, that a maize like plant was known to the ancients, the millet that came from the Indies into Italy. Ten years before Pliny wrote about it, hath some resemblance upon maize, maize, for it is a grain, as he says, that grows in reeds and covers itself with the leaf, and hath the top like hairs being very fertile, all of which things agree not with millet. Markham, 1880. So you see uh, Pliny uh, describing corn, uh, you know, without a doubt, because it doesn't fit millet, all right, the description, so. If we look closely at the hand of the winged figure from the palace of Sargon at a Akkad in Assyria, he appears to be holding something which he has just plucked from a sacred plant or tree and has sometimes been described as fir cone, a sponge, the spathe of a male date palm, Maspero, History of Egypt, Chaldea, or a head of corn or maize, America's ancient civilizations, A. Hyatt, Beryl and Rift, Beryl who, who taught, page 118. It seems probable that maize was carried from America to Asia by the earliest Sumerian voyagers, and we already know that it's very probable with all the evidence we've just read. But in its new home, where the people were unfamiliar with its proper cultivation and hybridization, it, it deteriorated and died out, whereas in America, 
where the Indians were familiar with the proper care of corn, it increased and improved. That should surprise us because corn or maize was not said to be imported into Europe until after the discovery of America by Chris Christopher Columbus in 1492. All right, so it says that should, that should surprise us. It, it definitely does, should surprise us. That's what I'm trying to point out here. But, you know, he's like, how come people ain't realizing this, right? Same thing. So it says here in 1492, although James Bailey, uh, God's, uh, God kings and titans tells us that maize was introduced into Spain by the Arabs in the 13th century. So more uh, corroboration saying the Arabs, right? And this is most likely uh, appearing to be most likely the Moors, right? That they're going back and forth.